Okay. Okay. Once again, part three, arguing with God, God and Abraham, sponsored by the Grisbinski family in honor of the memory of Dawn Grisbinski, David's sister. Very grateful to the Grisbinski family for sponsoring. La yes, last time we met, um, we spoke a little about Eov, and uh, I shared a midrash which indicated <clears throat> rabbinic uh, discontent, if you will, or disapproval uh, of Eov because he was complaining to God. And a few people raised the issue that that does not seem to jive with the the text, uh, it, the text itself. So I thought about that question, and I, I've been continuing reading uh, this wonderful book, Pious Irreverence, uh, by Dove Weiss, uh, which is a book that deals with confronting God in rabbinic Judaism, very much on our topic. <clears throat> and he actually covers this question. And on page 40, we're not going to go through them, but I just wanted to show, and I, I believe that I, I think Yassi Schiff is on. Um, yeah. And Yossi was concerned about this, and Yossi and I uh, shared a, a, a brief uh, uh, text exchange about this this week as well, um, that the, Dove Weiss goes through a list of psukim, and uh, if you want, I could, I could share this uh, source packet with anyone at the end if you want to go and see them on, on, see them on, your, on your own, where Eov does, in fact, complain to God, right? It's not a short list. It's not a terribly long list, but it's not a short list, and there are you know, nine or ten instances where uh, these are psukim from the book of Eov itself, where Eov uh, complains about his treatment or complains about the way God, um, the way that God judges, judges the world. So um, notwithstanding uh, the, the overall uh, perhaps uh, uh, a context uh, or feeling of the book, uh, there is, there are a number of times, I think Irv Rotter also was concerned about this, there are, there is a trend, certainly a trend within Safer Eov, where Eov is not a silent sufferer. Okay, that's just one important point, just in terms of, of what we had, of what we had discussed. Now, based on that, I wanted to share with you some really amazing Midrashim, because as I said, even though most of this class is focused on a positive rabbinic view of arguing with God, it's nice to round things out. And as I did last time, I'm going to share some of those uh, midrashim. And uh, two of them I, I came across, uh, which were really, really, uh, really amazing. Um, just, a la just one last point in terms of uh, this list of times where Eo does complain, does complain to God. Um, I'll just read you Dove Weiss's uh, conclusion to this list. He says uh, as follows, uh, even, when God conf even when Job confronts God directly, there is until the end of the book a deafening silence from heaven. Eventually, God, however, God responds to Job's uh, complaints, albeit with inconsistency. And that's his point, meaning even the book itself, when reflecting how God reacted to Eov's complaining, the book itself is inconsistent. While initially rebuking Job with, who is this who darkens counsel, uh, speaking without knowledge, speak only if you have understanding, God praises jo Job's speech at the book's close, declaring that contrary to his friends only, quote unquote, Job has spoken correctly. So the book itself um, uh, goes back and forth in terms of how God responds to Eov. If you want to take the last thing, or one of the last things that God says as the ultimate uh, judgment on Eov, uh, then it is possible. As the book concludes with divine praise, it's positive, excuse me, as the book concludes with divine praise and reward, one gets the impression, chapter 38 notwithstanding, that Job's protests are not regarded by God as sinful or rebellious. That may be the end of, of what the actual book looks, sounds like, but the rabbis had a different view. So this midrash I thought was just amazing. This midrash, oh, I want to make sure the sources are numbered. I thought I had done that. Let me just number the sources here. Uh, source number three is an amazing midrash uh, from the Pesikta Rabati. You see it's composed 845 of the Common Era. <coughs> it's an amazing co comment. Amar Rabbi Hanina Bar Papa, Ilu Lo Kara Tagar had 
What this means is, had um, Eo not complained against God, Kishem sheomrim achshav betfila Elohei Avraham, Elohei Yitzchak, Elohei Yaakov, just as now in the Amidah, we refer to God as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Kachayu omrim Elohei Elohe Eov. This is amazing. Had, God, had Eov not complained, say, say the rabbis, we would not only say God of Abraham, Isaac, and Yaakov, of Jacob, we would also say and God of Eov. Right? They're, they're, he was this close. Right? He was this close to being considered, I don't know if you want to say he would have been considered one of the, other, one of the forefathers, but he would have been up there uh, on such a high level of, of, um, of divine approval and of of divine and well let's see rabbinic approval because we know the rabbis wrote the Amidah, not god so rabbinic approval and the rabbinic desire to hold him up as a uh, to hold him up as a model of faith that we may have said elohe yakov um can you still hear me okay you elohe yakov so this is an amazing midrash. I mean, right? It's saying that Eov was such a tzaddik; he was so righteous that had he just held back, he would have been able to reach uh, that level. What's the um, what's the difference? What what was his what was his failure? So his failure was that he did complain, as now as as we've seen in these verses. And an, a, a, another midrash, actually in the same section, um, the midrash says, "Amr lo akadosh baruch hu." The rabbis. Now are are channeling God, and they say, "Lama takare tagar yisurim." Why are you complaining that that you suffered? Shema tagadol min haadam. Are you greater than Adam? Shal mitzvah chat shebitel gazarti lav mita v'al todotah v'lo kara tagar. That for one sin, right? For for uh, for one for for not fulfilling one mitzvah, right? For eating from the tree. I kicked it, I, I, I decreed death on him and on humankind that he didn't fetch. Ella Avraham Shinasitio to Kama Nisyanot and Abraham, who I tested many times, Al Shamar Bame Ida, but when he finally said, How am I gonna know that you have chosen me when he didn't have any children? Amarti Lo Yodote Daki Geri Azaracha. I told him that because of that slight uh, let's say hiccup in his faith, I decreed that his ancestors are going to, uh, his descendants are going to suffer in Egypt, and he didn't complain, below Karatagar, and you are, are you greater than Yitzchak, who because he loved Esau, I blinded him, and he didn't complain, meaning Abraham, Yitzchak, and uh, does he talk about Yaakov? Um, uh, no, but he talks about Moshe, are you greater than Moshe, uh, because he sinned, and I told him he can't get into Eretz Israel, and he didn't complain, are you greater than these people? So again, another rabbinic potch at Eov explaining the previous comment, right? The previous comment was, had he not complained, he would have made it into uh, the, 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 the tefillah. Okay, um, I'm going to stop here for a question. I see my mother has a question. Okay, I'm trying to unmute you. Could you unmute yourself? Nope, not working. Okay, uh, Emily. Emily, do you have a question? Didn't Moshe kind of, didn't he actually come in though, sort of? Mary? I'm sorry, say that again? Excuse me, Emily? excuse me, just one minute. Did... Go ahead, mom, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, Shula Yosha was on the phone and she's trying to get in and she doesn't know how to do it. So she thought maybe you could help her. Tell her I'll WhatsApp her the link. All she has to do is click on it. Thank okay, you. he's gonna. Did you hear that? He's gonna WhatsApp you the link, and you'll be able to. Okay, go ahead, uh, Emily. Didn't Moshe complain about it though? And like he was praying for it to be reversed, and then he's like kind of blaming the children of Israel for it. Well, he didn't blame God. I think that's the point. Um, al Hashem. Yes, no question about that. Et Hanan al Hashem, but he Et al Hashem means he he prayed to God. Um, but he did not, um, he did not, uh, argue with God, uh, if, if, uh, if you will. Yeah. Um, okay. 
uh, just a, a, on the Shuli Yosher issue, mom, tell her also, I'm going to, I'm going to email her the link that may be easier for her. So tell her that too, please. Just doing that now. Sorry, everyone. Just want to make sure everyone could get on. Okay, now we are back to our regularly scheduled program. Get the source sheet back up. Okay, here we go. Can everyone see the source sheet again? Okay, great. Now, just to, in terms of the, the challenge that we're dealing with, in terms of arguing with God, I want to show you, I want to go through quickly um, uh, two sources um, uh, that talk about the challenge that we have in general, forget about arguing with God, I want to expand it for a minute and, and, and just talk about the challenge that the rabbis have in, um, in even speaking to God, in the, in the sense of davening, right, in tefillah, right? The, if we talk about like the, the levels, right, the arguing with God is the, let's call it on the chutzpah meter, right? Arguing with God is the highest level of, uh, of chutzpah, uh, the chutzpah meter. Uh, but what about just davening, right? What the, the, the rabbis in many places, I'm going to show you just some, some modern sources, but there's a, a, a discussion, a trend where we have to ask ourselves, what gives us the right to even uh, talk to God, to even bring ourselves to ask God of things or even to praise God, right? What gives us the right, uh, the right to, uh, to do that, right? If, if we understand, right, the, the, our modern understanding of God is that God is, so different than us and so omnipotent and and and, and perfect in, in every way and uh and and so transcendent right this is uh the Maimedian view and really the the the, uh, the view of god that seems to win the day right what gives us the the right to even approach to even approach god and rabbi salavachik dealt with this uh, the best treatment of this uh is by the way in the introduction to the rca Art Scroll edition of the Sidur. That's the one that we have at Shul. Uh, we'll get back there. That's the one we have in Shul. Um, Rabbi Saul Berman wrote a beautiful introduction to Tefillah, and um, he, he discusses this idea, but really it's an idea that comes from Rabbi Soloveitchik, okay? And I'm gonna share with you a, a piece from Rabbi Soloveitchik and from another, another contem and, and a contemporary rabbi uh, Rabbi Soloveitchik is wondering um, wh why uh, many of the brachot, this is in an essay uh, in, from a book called Reflections on the Sidur and Synagogue, which is this wonderful thing, this is the newest collection of essays by Rabbi Soloveitchik. Um, and in an essay called The Morning Blessings, um, Rabbi Soloveitchik uh, says, um, uh, says the following. He's, he's wondering why the morning blessings have the specific type of language where they seem to borrow from biblical language. And he says, before we can answer these questions, let us analyze the phraseology of the blessings. There is no doubt that our sages avoided as much as possible coining new idioms and phrases in the liturgy. They tried to draw upon biblical sources, familiar patterns and structural forms, and borrowed expressions and terms from the prophets when they instituted the morning blessing. Sometimes what they found in Tanakh did not meet the liturgical needs. Indeed, some paragraphs are original, but generally the phrases and idioms have been taken from the Tanakh. Why? The morning blessings were not an exception to the general rule adopted by our sages that prayer is something paradoxical, bordering almost on the absurd. That's Rabbi Soloveitchik's main point. The ability to daven in Rabbi Soloveitchik's mind, and he's projecting this onto the rabbis as well, doesn't make any sense. It is a performance whose meaning and justification transcend the bounds of human intelligence, possible thanks to a specific act of grace on the part of God the Almighty, who allows unworthy human beings to converse with him. On our own, we do not know how to start the conversation. We are completely ignorant of the basic principles and criteria of prayer. Meaning if we, I, I, if we really thought about this, so I, I saw this somewhere else, I don't recall where, if before we started to daven, we really thought about what it meant to daven, we would be dumbstruck. We certainly, we just wouldn't be able to do it. We do not know how to pray, what to say, how to address ourselves to God and how to implore him, how to invoke his help or his presence. How can the simpleton, whose manners are coarse, whose language is inadequate, and whose appearance is vulgar, appear before the great and august king? 
Hopefully by August, we'll be able to stand before the king as well in Shul. We still do not understand why Abel's sacrifice went up in flames toward heaven, while Cain, who probably tried his utmost to please the Almighty, received no sign of divine attention to his sacrifice, etc. How can we say with such how can we say which prayer is appropriate and which prayer not appropriate? So his point of, of using biblical models and biblical language to say, well, if we're gonna pray, at least let's let's use examples that have the imprimatur of God because he put them in the Bible, right? They're included in the Torah. Once they're included in the Torah, at least they have some sense of, uh, of, of acceptance and, and, uh, and, and uh, being appropriate in terms of addressing God. So I bring this to your attention just to, uh, as sort of just an interesting um, thing to think about, that arguing with God is, is one thing, but even the notion of talking to God at all without arguing is not so simple for the rabbis to uh, to accept. So when they po- when they look in a positive way um, on on arguing with God, it's even a greater leap. I mean, maybe that's the main point. It's even a greater leap than just than just talking to God. And, and so this is something to think about next time we dive in, not to paralyze ourselves so that we cannot dive in, but to really think about just what an awesome move it is for a human being uh, and what for a human being to stand before God and address God directly. Uh, a, a contemporary rabbi, Rabbi Nathan Lopez Cardozo, uh, wrote the introduction to the Nahalel Sidur. The Nahalel Sidur is really wonderful. I, I recommend it. It is a Sidur that has, it comes with pictures. Who doesn't like a book with pictures? Um, and what it does on each page, a certain phrase is highlighted in a different color, and the picture corresponds to the phrase. So if it talks about God making the oceans, there'll be a beautiful picture of an ocean. If it talks about Jerusalem, there'll be a picture of Jerusalem. If it talks about, um, uh, right, in Hallel, uh, the, 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 the deers dancing, there's a picture of deers prancing through an open meadow or through a forest. So it really helps you connect to the tefillah. It's beautiful. And in an introduction, uh, Rabbi Cardozo, so that it's called Nahalel. You see the spelling here. There's a weekday version and a Shabbat version. Uh, that's a that's a marketing tool. Make sure you have to buy two sidurim, um, <clears throat> but uh, they're wonderful. I, I just dove in, um, uh, on Sunday on Rosh Chodesh with the weekday sidur, and I was browsing through it, and I saw this introduction. And he says, as well, this is a great title, prayer as chutzpah. How does man dare speak to God, the master of the universe? The presumption that man can just open his mouth and believe what God will listen to him is unrivaled impertinence. When someone wishes to get an audience with the queen, much paperwork has to be done, many meetings are held by ministers and officials and security issues are concerned. After all that, maybe he'll be granted an audience in Buckingham Palace, right? It's just it's channeling Rabbi Soloveitchik but putting it in different uh, terms. There's this gr- great quote uh, in German, which I can't, I'm not gonna try to uh, pronounce. He who praises another places himself on the other's level. Indeed, what right has man to praise God? We don't really know the answer to this question. Perhaps we are like the atheist who said he praised God every day because it was the only way to convince himself that he was not God. So the same idea that that talking to God, praising God, is really a theologically hard thing to swallow. And the third source, and before I say anything about the source, I want to thank Yossi Schiff and his son Yoni, uh, for translating this. This is a piece from Rav Cook. Rav Cook uh, um, wrote um, a collection on some of the Agadic, some of the Nam Halachic uh, parts of the Talmud, amongst many other things. And uh, there's a, there's a, and, and uh, this is a, one of them. And I asked Yossi to, a favor, a big favor uh, this week, if he could translate, uh, translate it. And he did. It's a great translation. We're going to see a piece of it. Um, but it's on the phrase as follows. Um, Before a person prays the Amida, which is essentially asking God for things, the first thing we have to do is we have to praise God, right? First we praise God, and then we ask God for things. This praising God is what we call Pesuke de Zimra. Right? If you're familiar with the Shacharit service, we have the morning blessings and the Karbanot, and then we move on to Psuke de Zimra, uh, paragraphs and, of praise. And 
before we are allowed to ask God, we have to praise. And Rabbi Rav Cook explains why. Uh, his, 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 the point is that when the point is that that we are not supposed to look at prayer as a way to sort of whittle something from God, right? It's not the it's not some way to uh, to uh, try to trick God or convince God to give us something. That's not the focus of prayer. That's not even the focus of the bakashot uh, of prayer. The the main part of prayer is in order for us to to ethically perfect ourselves. Uh, let's just read two or three paragraphs. Prayer needs to be dis disentangled from any notion that it causes a change in the divine desire or action, meaning of God. And since this is a misconception, which brings like every misconception about God, a corruption of the perfection of humankind, both in terms of the value of prayer and the trust in its action as a whole, and in terms of being granted that which is requested. Sincere prayer is a cornerstone in the perfection of humankind and merits the elevation of the soul. We, we don't pray to get things, we pray to become better, to perfect ourselves. Therefore, everyone who prays must understand that prayer is a wonderful law that God legislated in this world for the purpose of bringing his creations closer to perfection with the goal of perfecting their morality, which is uniquely achieved through prayer. And prayer is not to be understood uh, as mutba in the laws of God. I mean, it's not about God so much. Therefore, every Amidah must be preceded by praise to demonstrate that it is appropriate to praise the existence of a law to pray, that it is not understandable in our limited human nature, but only as a metaphor for the divine realm. So again, the, 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 the gap between us and God and that prayer is different than we think. And the, the, the original reason I wanted to bring this although Yossi's excellent translation indicates uh, that there's many ways to interpret this, is because in this other book called In His Image, or Rabbi Yuval Shirlow, uh, which we talked about before, he mentions this idea of Rav Cook, and I double-checked with Rav Shirlow to make sure that I found the right passage, because it's not footnoted. But this is what Rav Shirlow says. Whether or not is exactly what Rav Cook meant is debatable. And again, I thank Yossi for pointing that out. Um, but nonetheless, Rav Shirlo is saying it. He says, it is in this fashion that Rabbi Cook explained the requirement that actual prayer be preceded by singing God's praises. The very essence of prayer places the praying human being and the divine listener on the same level. Like, the, like we saw that German quote, only this common ground can allow for any kind of dialogue. However, in order to avoid the danger of blurring the lines between man and God, Halacha demands that man preface his request from God with praise of God, deeply ingraining in man the sense of the infinite gap between him, between himself and God. In prayer, man undergoes a dual human experience, having been created in the image of God, forms a common plane, being dust of the earth establishes the inequality. Man's prayer is prefaced by a recitation of words of praise for God expressing that disparity. So again, another contemporary author uh, explain to us that the whole notion of prayer is, it, it's really uh, very, comp it's, it's a theologically very difficult thing to wrap ourselves around. Again, assuming we ex accept this uh, notion of God as being so transcendent and so different than, than we are. So it's not only that arguing with God that is complex, even talking to God has its own complexities. I hope I didn't just ruin davening for all of you. Um, uh, I hope I gave you something to think about. Okay. To Avraham. Avraham argues with God about God's discussion, decision to destroy Sodom. Okay? Here are the Psukim from chapter 18 in Sefer Bereshit. We're going to see a number of very interesting takes on this. So God tells, uh, God says, Am I going to hide this? Uh, I can't, I can't hide this from uh, I can't hide this from. Abraham, right? I have to, um, can you all hear me? Uh, this is from Abraham. I have to, um, I have to tell him. Why do I have to tell him? After all, Abraham is to become a great and populous nation and all the nations of the earth are to bless themselves by him. For I have singled him out that he may instruct his children and his posterity to keep the ways of the Lord by doing what is tzedakah u mishpat. 
Okay, tzedakah u mishpat. This is interesting. The first interesting point here. God says, I need to tell Avraham. Because Avraham is going to tell everyone about the importance of tzedakah. I didn't translate that on purpose. And mishpat, and righteousness. And I'm about to do something. Which what? It may seem to him to be not and not Sedek, and not righteous, and not Sedek. So I have to tell him. So already, in before God tells Abraham, we have it foreshadowed that God knows there's a problem coming. This was a very interesting thing to, to consider, right? We, we shouldn't think that God is surprised by Yaakov's arguing with him about the destruction of Sodom. God himself foreshadows it by saying that he is that he chose Yaakov because he was going to teach him his children, Tzedakah and Mishpat, and what he's about to do is going to be perceived by Yaakov as not being um, in, in, uh, in keeping with Tzedakah and Mishpat, and so therefore, uh, therefore I, better, I better tell him. Uh, so that's, uh, that's point number one, okay? So then, we, 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 we're familiar with... Um, with uh, Avraham's uh, complaints. God says uh, the things of Sodom and Gomorrah are, are, are coming, uh, coming before me. Um, I'm going to go down. I'm going to see what's going on there. And I, I don't want to get into the, all this whole question. It means that God had to go down and see what was going on. The, 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 the traditional commentaries explain this as um, just language to, to help us understand what's going on. Uh, while the less traditional commentaries suggest that the Bible is giving us a very different view of God, of how the Bible understands God, as opposed to the way we understand God. We understand God in completely, completely absent and above uh, any human terms or any weakness or shortcoming. Uh, while if you read the Bible, certainly in Genesis, uh, it's not clear, and that um, is something the book, The Genesis of Ethics by Burton Vysotsky, uh, talks about. Uh, we don't have time to go into that t- uh, today. So, Vayigash uh, Avraham Vayomar, Ha'af Tisbet Sadikim Rasha, are you going to sweep away the innocent and guilty? And then he goes to uh, bargain with him. Okay? What's interesting to note is that Abraham, over and over and over again, says to God, I'm not worthy, but, right? I'm not, but. For example, in verse 27, Bayan, Abraham, Bayomar, Ine, Naho, Alti, Ladaver, Ladunai, Vanohi, Afar, Vaefer, I venture to speak to my Lord, uh, I who am but dust and ashes, and then uh, later on, uh, in, in verse 28 and verse 30, Vayomer al-nai yichar la'adonai va'adabera, don't be angry with me if I speak. Again, 31, let my Lord not be angry if I go on. Vayomer al-nai yichar la'adonai va'adabera, acha pam, one more. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak. Abraham over and over again, um, this is something which we did not see and I'm here for an answer question. This is something that we did not see in the no, in the Adam and and uh, Cain complaints, right? When Adam argues with God and Cain argues with God, we do not see this type of shrinking uh, bet of uh, of Abraham, where Abraham uh, says, I- "I'm really not, I'm not worthy," and he does it anyway. The, the question is, what is this? The Torah is introducing, uh, introducing something here which did not exist before. So anyone want to take a stab at that? The Torah introducing here um, that was not introduced in the other two areas uh, of God that we saw vis-a-vis Adam and uh, Cain. Anyone want to take a stab? First, I'll look for anyone's hand up, and then I will um, unmute. Anybody? 
Okay, let me unmute. I'm, I'm looking to see if anyone's raising their hand. I see Lou. Okay, all right, go ahead, Lou. Okay, in the previous chapters, man it, it, it thinks he's equal to God. Uh, here, Abraham shows his humility. You know, I'm nothing but dust and ashes. Uh, don't be mad at me. He's recognized that uh, he's very, very inferior to the supreme being. Yes, that's for sure. Yeah, that is for sure being added here. Um, the question is, why? Why? Why all of a sudden? What? Yeah, th that's the additional element. Why do you think? And what? What does it? What does it add to the story? What does it add to the story of uh, of of uh, of Abraham arguing with God? Anybody else? Carol, I'm trying to. I'm oh, sorry. Wait, 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 wait. Could you unmute yourself? So. No. Oh, okay. Good. Um. It's, it's sort of uh, establishing a different relationship between them. He's really, uh, he, he's really saying, I'm down here and you're up there. If you look at some of the conversations um, that we talked about before with Adam and with Cain, it's, they're arguing with him sort of more from an equal level. Yeah. So yeah, I think what I think what's happening here is that Avraham's Avraham's complaint is that it's it's true. I'm just a I'm just a human being, but these are the rules that you made, right? These are the rules that you made, and you have to play by the same. You have to play by the rules, right? So by by diminishing himself, he's doing something paradoxical. He's also saying, I think, I'm just a human being, but my expectation of you, God, is that you play by the same rules that I'm expected to play by. And so I'm reminding you over and over again that I'm, I'm just a human being and I, I don't have your stature, but right after I say I don't have your stature, I'm going to put your feet to the fire because these are the rules that you made and you have to, you have to, play, you have to play by them. So... It's sort of like it, it's almost like a little bit of a, of a, like a cat and mouse or a game that Avraham is, 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 uh, is, is playing here. Uh, when he reminds, he, he, he reminds God, I know that I'm not God, but that doesn't matter. I don't have to be God to expect that God play by the same rules that he expects us, uh, that he expects us to to, to play by. And that may be also what God was alluding to here, where he said that I chose Abraham because Abraham is going to teach his people about tzedakah and righteousness. And that's what I want in the world. And so I was like, well, that's what you want in the world. And that's why you chose me. Well, what's going on here? This does not seem to play into, uh, into that. Um, so that's, that's sort of one just more, just more, just a general approach of how we can understand what gave, I see you dove, what gave, uh, what gave Avraham the right, uh, the right to do that? I'm going to take Dove, and then we're going to go through uh, two Sephornos, a Rashi, and uh, some more Midrashim before we call it a day. Okay, Dove, go ahead. This is the first complaint we've had with God, or Greg with God, that's not personal. Yes, right. Adam and Cain are talking about, about stuff yeah. that happened to them. Yeah. This is a gripe about the way the world's going to work, and 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 you know and what what's 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 right and wrong. Adam and Cain don't seem to care what's right and what's care is good for me, and Abraham is taking this to a level of complaining about something that's nothing to do with him, you know, and even to the point where he lots there, but God lets lot out, so it's it's very impersonal. And, and, you know, to say that I just, you know, and, and it's, it's really the first time we have an establishment of a, a, a you know, attempted a universal kind of a code. Or yeah. somebody wiping about an apparent universal code. Right. So this, this raises the stakes and raises the 
I would say, I think what you're saying, this raises the quality of the argument. Right. Right. This is, and but although, although we have to also remember, maybe a little kink in that theory, Avraham had Lot in Sodom. Right. And at this point, we don't know that Lot is going to be saved. Avraham doesn't know Lot's going to be saved, but, but to, and this is what uh, uh, Visotsky says in this book, he says, maybe that's why Avraham didn't go lower in the numbers, because then it would be too obvious that it was self-serving. Okay. Maybe there's one Sadiq, or who could that possibly be if not Lot, right? So Avraham maybe didn't go lower because he didn't want it to become too obvious uh, that he was looking after Lot. But you're right, this is universal and raises the quality of it. Okay, um, I see uh, Irv has a hand up. Okay, uh, I'm trying to unmute you. Can you unmute yourself, Irv? I'm going to unmute everyone, but that didn't work. I, un I unmuted everyone, and Irv, you're still muted. So you have muted yourself. You have to unmute yourself. Okay. Yeah, um, got it. Go. Me now. Uh, actually, Avram doesn't get the chance to go. Say again? God, God breaks off the conversation. Um... You're right. At thirty, at, I mean, in verse thirty-three, Avraham does. Yeah, that's although, although, you know, well, I'm not sure. Yeah. Well, yeah, you're, you're right. God does break it down, but you could argue that God could have sort of chased after him and said, "Hey, I'm not done yet." But you're right. God does break it down. But that's a good, that's a fair point. You're saying in, in response to him not asking for fewer tzaddikim, which would have which would have uh, revealed that he was in it for self-service purposes for his family of love. It's actually not even, it's not only self-serving, the issue is the unanswered question is why not one? Right, why not even one? And that, yeah, and it's, I haven't seen anything very good on that other than to say Abraham is looking for a critical mass of tzaddikim who could have an effect on everyone else and maybe one is not enough. Um, and the other point is that in the end, the righteous people are saved. Uh, presumably, these are the only righteous people in the city. So God somewhat hears Avraham. When Avraham says, Haf tispet, sadikim rasha, are you going to destroy the innocent with the guilty? In the end, God hears Avraham and says, no, you're right. I'm not going to destroy the innocent with the guilty. He, uh, he, Avraham's making two points. Maybe you should save everyone on account of the 50 because that, those people will... Uh, be able to have a positive effect on everyone else, and they'll do tshuva, like a, like a Yonah situation. Um, second argument is, even if there are not enough people to save the everyone, to influence everyone, you, know, you shouldn't kill the righteous with the wicked. And in the end, God hears that and does not destroy the righteous uh, with the wicked. Okay, um, I want to look at a Rashi, a, a neat Rashi. Um, in terms of trying to explain uh, the language in verse 25. I don't have it here. 25 or 35. 25. Maybe the of the whole conversation. Far be it for you to do such a thing, to bring death upon the innocent as well as the guilty, so that innocent and guilty fare alike. Far be it from you, shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? Rashi here, Rashi here is really nice. Rashi says, This is a profanation of your name, meaning this is a chilol Hashem, meaning this is interesting. Avram is telling God, and, and, and this is a, based on a midrash, so the rabbis here are channeling incredible chutzpah. Ad, uh, Avram is saying to God, you, God, are going are to profane your own name. Chulin hulach, yomar kachu umanuso. This is, this is a very careful use of language. People are going to say, this is how you usually operate. What does that mean, this is how you usually operate? What could Avraham, in the rabbi's minds, possibly be thinking about? 
when he says this is the way you usually operate. Th is this a pattern? And yes, the commentaries on Rosh say, yes, Avraham here is saying, you destroyed the world during the time of Noah. There is the door, the door of Haflaga, right? You've done this now a few times, the dispersion. You've done this a few times. If you do this again now, people are going to say, oh, this is, this is the way God operates. He doesn't like it. He just destroys everyone. So Khalilalach, this is, this is, so on the one hand, it's incredible chutzpah that, that Avraham is telling God that he is going to profane his own name. On the other hand, God could say, Avraham would say, wait a second, I'm just trying to help you. I am your image consultant. And your image is going to take a beating if you do this, because everyone's going to think this is the way you normally operate. You just destroy people when you don't like what's going on. You don't give people chances. So it's chutzpah, but yet it's... Now, of course, in our mind, we would think God would know this already, and that raises the whole question. But again, if we're looking at this as a way to, to learn sort of big, big lessons, right? Uh, this this uh, is a lesson of, of, um, of how God is perceived in the world, or how maybe we would be perceived in the world, but how God is perceived uh, uh, in, in the world, and Avram acting as a... Um, as, a, as an image consultant for God. Okay, three more midrashim, which I thought were really interesting to sort of round out the picture. Um, this is the, I'm, I'm sorry, this is not a midrash, this is the commentary called the Akidat Yitzchak, Vayigash Avraham, uh, right? Avraham went forward to God. By the way, Vayigash has a special connotation, right? Vayigash Elav Yehuda, when Yehuda in, in, uh, at the end of the book of Genesis went to speak to Paro, who was really Yosef, I think Rashi there says, Vayigash, he was going to speak kashot. He was going to speak harshly. Okay, meaning the notion of Vayigash is not uh, a simple, nice, nice way of approaching someone. This, Avraham is, is, is outraged here. Ki me'achar she'skima dat el yonah l'daber b'fanav matza atzmo mechuyav l'halitz v'adam. This is a great lesson. Avraham realized that once God, once God has already turned to me as his guy, I have no choice but now to use that power to, uh, to, to, to try to defend them. This is a beautiful lesson. Explanation of, of Avram Schutz, but a beautiful lesson for us. Right? If, if, if you have the ability to speak up on behalf of someone, because you have the ear of the person, you have a moral obligation to do it. I have God's ear. So I don't know why. God has chosen me. But from that moment on, I have to speak up. Right? So here, this is this explains Avram Schutz too. Like he couldn't help himself. Like it welled up in him. And he had no choice but to do this, even though it was chutzpah. And that is another way of explaining all of the hemming and hawing. I'm, I'm not worthy. I don't deserve this. Who am I? But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if I'm worthy. At the end of the day, for Avram, it didn't make a difference if he was acting in a, in, in a way which is inappropriate. Because he couldn't help himself. Once he found himself in the position of influence, he had to, he had to say it. Right? it, it like I said, it, it just came from his kishkas. And he could not, he could not, he could not help himself. Okay, Five, final two, two points in the Midrash. Uh, Larry? Yeah. Go ahead. Not to jump ahead, but that's exactly Moshe, right? He's close to God, and when God wants to do something, he says, what will the Goyim think, and, you know, et cetera. Right, and he says, if you're gonna if you're gonna destroy them, mecheninam misifrotha, wipe me out of your book. Yeah, yeah. Right. correct. Yeah. Uh, okay, we're gonna get Yassi, and then we have to go. We have to move on. Go ahead. Yassi again. Thank you very much for your translation. Uh, you're very welcome. I uh, I hope everybody enjoyed it. Um, I just wanted to say something. Um, the the relationship between God and Avram here is very fascinating, but there's one aspect. Avram is actually living up to the expectation of God. 
because when God is saying, I'm going to talk to Abraham, because I know that Tzedakah Mishpat is important to him, Abraham doesn't know what God is thinking about him. But God is giving him the opportunity to actually prove... Actualize, yeah, that he's the right guy. That he is the right guy. So, so uh-huh. God is expecting that to happen, and Abraham is uh, you know, feeling... Uh, Beautiful. Living up to everything that God is... is uh, you know, all the praise that God gave, uh, uh, gave yeah. on so him. Actually, Yossi, it could be that this is a test. Exactly. It's not counted, by the way, as one of the 10 Nisio notes, I don't think, in most of the lists that we have. But this may be a test. Uh, God's, like you're saying, God's testing him to see if he's going to stand up. And now, uh, one of course, is, is, uh, I just wanted to say that uh, Abraham is actually um, teaching us how we should uh, plead our case in court. Because you're standing before the judge who happened also to be the executioner. <laughs> um, so you, say, you, you have to be humble. And, I mean, you have to plead your case, but you have to all the time um, express your understanding that there is a difference in statue between you and the person or whoever you're, you're pleading your case to. So that's, and that's the difference between Adam and Cain and Abraham, because Adam and Cain didn't know exactly how to relate to God because it was the first for mankind. Abraham is actually standing in court here and he's trying to convince the court and this is how you do it. You, you are very respectful, but you are very forceful when you want to please yes. your case. Yeah. The so. word that, um, that Vizitovsky uses is submit. To survive in the world, you have to submit to God and deceive human beings. We're going to get to Avram's. De- well, another time we talk about Avram deceiving people. But yes, excellent. And I will just add a very provocative comment, b- basing off Yassi, which I think Yassi is going to appreciate. If Avram passed this test by complaining about injustice, does it mean he failed the test when he agreed to bring his son up on the altar? Was that a he, that's a whole nother discussion. I'm, Dove's nodding your head. I know that you agree with that, Dove. We've had a discussion before. Okay, let's look at these last two midrashim. Amar Levi, Lama Gila Kadosh Baruch Abraham. Another question. Right, we already discussed this a little bit, but why did uh, God tell Abraham? Why did he feel he had to tell Abraham that he was going to do this? Listen to what the rabbis do here. Shehaya maharer al dor hamabul lomar. God knew that Avraham was already thinking, Avraham knew the story of the, of, the, of the Mabul, of the flood. And God knew that Avraham, as he's growing up, he's thinking, what did God do then? I never thought about that. I never really thought about biblical characters thinking about other events in the Torah. So the rabbis say here, just like you and I learn events in the Torah, Avraham also learned about this flood that took place many years ago, and, uh, and God killed everybody. And Avraham's thinking, were there not 20 or 10 Sadiqim that God could have used to save the world in their merit? Lefichach, Amar HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Gole Ani Lo, Shelo Ye Omer, Shema Af Bistom Hayu Tzadikim. Therefore, I have to tell him before I do it, so that after I do it, he doesn't come back and say to me, maybe they were righteous people. Meaning this whole, con- God wanted this whole conversation to happen to preempt Avraham from claiming that he was unjust by killing Sodom before God, before Avraham knew that there were no righteous people there. And once he told him, once Abraham uh, told him, once God told him, Abraham right away went in there and, um, and, uh, and, and like we said, stood up to, to God in that way. Uh, so this explains why God had to tell Abraham at all. It's another question. If we, like we said earlier, even talking to God in tefillah is a paradox and doesn't make any sense, why would God uh, speak to a lowly human being and tell him in advance about what his plans are going to be? So here... Uh, it's, uh, they're suggesting uh, is because Abraham knew 
that uh, God knew that Abraham was the right guy. God knew that Abraham was the man who was going to question what he perceived as injustice. And so therefore he told him in advance. And I wanted to show you one other uh, thing um, about, uh, about Sarah. Because right, Sarah doesn't get any play in this. Sarah's not involved. But we also have, I wanted to show you that Sarah also sometimes um, argued uh, with God and complained with God. And this doesn't really connect 100% to what we did, but just a really fascinating midrash. Amar of Brachia. This is when she was taken by Avimelech. And the whole night, that, uh, the midrash says, she was lying on her face. Va'omeret, meaning she was she was prostrated, she was davening. Va'omeret, ribon ha'olamim, master of the universe, master of the worlds. Avraham yatsa behaftacha. Listen to this. Vani yatsati beemuna. This is amazing. You think Avraham's your guy? He did everything only after you promised him haftacha. You promised him. He's going to be a great nation. He's going to get the land and everything's going to be okay. So he went. You didn't promise any of that to me. I went on faith. You promised Abraham. I went on faith. And this is what you're doing to me? You have me stuck in this palace with this Eisvarf, is what you probably called him. Right? This is a real example of arguing with God. Where is, where is your sense of, of, uh, of fairness here. Avraham yatsa chutz l'sira v'ani betoch ha-sira amar la kadosh baruch hu kol ma shani yoseh b'shvilech ani yoseh v'akol omrim al davar sarai eshet avim. That's what happens in the story. Everything that's going to happen now to Avimelech and his court, everyone is going to know because, that I did it because of you. So here again, God buys it. He accepts Sarah's complaint uh, that she really was of greater faith. This is a, a, a greater faith than Avraham, because Avraham was promised, and when God promised you something, you believe it, but God didn't promise her anything. So here we have uh, Avraham, uh, Sarah, sort of following along in this uh, uh, biblical tradition of arguing with God and really bringing a very harsh uh, claim against God, if you will. At the end, did Avraham's arguing and debating and tactics with God work? On the one hand, uh, Stom and the other cities were destroyed. On the other hand, Lot was saved. Do we know that Lot wasn't going to be saved beforehand? We don't. But we do know that he was saved afterwards based on, or at least from the text it looks like, uh, based on Avraham's uh, on Abraham's uh, on Abraham's claim, and I'll just uh, close with uh, Rav Shirlo again, because again the point here is the main point of this is, is, is that the Tzelam Elokim. This is what we started with in 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 the first uh, in the first class, right? The fact that we are created with Tzelam Elokim, with free choice and free thought, gives us the opportunity and in what we learned from Avraham, the obligation to speak on behalf of tzedakah and mishpat. And this is what Rav Shirlo says. Um, The divine image in man comes to its most exalted expression here. Abraham opens by requesting permission to make arguments, recognizes himself as dust and ashes, and acknowledges the gap between the infinite and his own feeble existence. Following this, he draws claims as he understands them from the general world of morality. God listens to his words without denying his right to argue or negating the quality of the arguments and does not harm Abraham for making them. The pinnacle of this dialogue is manifest in God's actions. They are different from his original intent as a result of Abraham speaking his peace. So, so far we're three for three. God has changed his mind, so to speak, in the face of Abraham's claims. So just to really quickly review. We started with Eov and the possibility that Eov does, in fact, argue with God often in Sefer Eov. Uh, and the Midrash that suggests that had Eov not done that, uh, he would have, um, we, we would be able to say, okay, 
Eov, but the problem with this Midrash, of course, is we do say Elohe Avraham, and, and Avraham did complain. That's inconsistent. The Midrash is saying, had Eov not complained, he would have been included, but Avraham does complain, and he is included. Um, so the, maybe, maybe the distinction is in what Dove said, that Eov's complaints were about what he was experiencing, and Avraham's complaints were about righteousness and justice writ large for the whole world, and that's an important distinction. Maybe that's why Avraham makes it in, and Eov doesn't. Then we talked about the general problem of davening uh, in, its, in itself, that just standing before God is theologically really troubling and not so simple to say, even though we do it all the time, but it really takes a, uh, we only do it, according to Rabbi Soloveitchik at least, when we have a rabbinic model that we're basing ourselves on, which is why Rabbi Soloveitchik was very against to any new type of liturgy. This is the philosophical reason behind uh, that opposition. And then we get into this notion of Avraham, that he really holds God to the fire. God made the rules. God has to follow the same rules uh, as everybody else. And, uh, and uh, the idea that it, it swelled up from Abraham's inside, that he couldn't help himself. Uh, and, uh, and that is uh, like Moshe also, that he couldn't help himself, but come to the defense of people once he had God in, 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 at his ear. And the notion of Chilul Hashem, right? The notion of Abraham trying to avoid, even at the cost of being uh, impertinent to God, at the, 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 the desire to protect God from this uh, idea of, um, of Chil Hashem, that his actions would be interpreted, that he's, a, that, that he's essentially a bully, uh, and that uh, Avraham did not want to allow that to happen. Okay, everyone, we have to stop here. I thank you all for, uh, for joining. I thank all those of you who made comments. Uh, they were most insightful and helpful. Once again, I thank Yossi Schiff for translating the piece from Rav Cook, and I thank the Grzbinski family for sponsoring the class in honor of the memory of Dawn Grzbinski, David's sister. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Wednesday at 12 o'clock is one of the evening. Wednesday at 12 o'clock is Lunch and Learn. Please join us then. Thank Shalom, you. everybody. Thank you. Yeah.